Turn in your Bibles today to the book of Acts, chapter 15, and we will begin our study in verse 32. Let's, uh, let's begin with prayer. This is our 13th study in the book of Acts. And Father, we ask that our hearts are good ground, that we would hear your word and understand your word, and that your word would bear fruit in our lives 100-fold. May we be like trees planted by the rivers of water that brings forth fruit in its season, that our leaves would not wither and whatsoever we do would prosper in Jesus' name. Amen. Now last time, Paul and Barnabas were in the church in Antioch, and it was a Gentile church for the most part. And everything was going great, but some false teachers came in, Jewish teachers, and said, well, you need Christ, but you also need to be circumcised, and you need to keep the Jewish law. Paul and Barnabas disagreed, but they went to Jerusalem, they traveled to Jerusalem, to get the definitive, definitive word from Peter and the other apostles. And the decree came down. They decided that you do not have to be circumcised to be, a, to be a Christian. You do not have to keep the old Jewish ceremonial law to be a Christian. So now, as we come to our reading in verse 30 of Acts chapter 15, Paul and Barnabas, along with two men from Jerusalem, are taken that report back to the church in Antioch. Let's read in verse 30. So when they were sent off, they came to Antioch, and when they had gathered the multitude together, they delivered the letter. When they had read it, they rejoiced over its encouragement. Now, Judas and Silas themselves, those were the two men that came with Paul and Barnabas from Jerusalem, being prophets, also exhorted and strengthened the brethren with many words. And after they had stayed there for a time, they were sent back with greetings from the brethren to the apostles. However, it seemed good to Silas to remain there. Paul and Silas must have connected right away. Silas later joined Paul on his second missionary journey. And the thing that stood out to me here is that God was doing more than one thing with this um, doctrinal problem, this false teaching. He had Paul and Barnabas go down to Jerusalem, they got the decree, but he was doing other things too, like bringing Paul and Silas together. The Holy Spirit knows how to bring the right people together, the right people into your life, as we walk in obedience to God. God brings the right people our way. 35. Paul and Barnabas also remained in Antioch teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. And so there were many teachers in the Antioch church. doesn't say there were too many, just many. You, you, you can never have too many teachers of God's word, that's for sure. 36. Then after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, Let us now go back and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. Paul was concerned about those Gentile churches that he had started on his first missionary journey. He remembers how fickle the Gentiles were. One minute they were worshiping him, the next minute they were stoning him to death. And you know, people like that, even after they receive Christ, can be easily turned away from simple truth. So Paul wants to return to those churches and make sure they are okay. 37. Now Barnabas was determined to take with them John called Mark. On their first missionary trip, John Mark, young John Mark, went along with Barnabas and Saul. But he quit, and he went home. And Barnabas wants to give Mark another chance, because that's just the kind of guy Barnabas is. And credit Mark also for wanting to try again, after failing Christ. Don't ever let failure stop you from trying again with Jesus. No matter how many times you fail, get back up, try again. Don't quit on him. 38. But Paul insisted that they should not take with them the one who had departed from them in Pamphylia 
and had not gone with them to the work. So Paul, he insisted that John Mark not come along. Paul, you know, lived to do God's will. And I don't think he wanted either himself or any of the the uh, new Gentile Christians to be distracted by a faint-hearted Mark. Now, he may have come across as being harsh, but remember, he is doing it for the glory of God. And sometimes, sometimes you have to be tough. Verse 39. Then the contention between, became so sharp that they, they parted from one another, and so Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus. And so Paul and Barnabas had a disagreement, and the Bible doesn't condemn either one of them for this disagreement. They just decided to go different ways. And sometimes that is God's will. And some Christians just find that so hard to believe. Find it hard to believe that God would ever lead another Christian to do something different than them. Or in a different way than they would do it. But that is the way it works sometimes. And Christians need to accept that. Verse 40. But Paul chose Silas and departed, being commended by the heathen to the grace of God. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. And so, Paul and Barnabas go different directions, and God used both of them. Patience with Mark by Barnabas paid off, because he ended up being a very strong Christian. And a later, a great help to Paul and the writer of the Gospel of Mark. And so you see, everything has a way of working out if we just listen to God and follow his leading. Chapter 16, verse 1. Then he came to Derbe and Lystra. Paul and, Barnabas came, or Paul and Silas came to Derbe and Lystra. And behold, a certain disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a certain Jewish woman who believed, but his father was a Greek. Now, Timothy, as we will see, was a very spiritually strong young man. He had a godly mother and a godly grandmother, and that got him off on the right track with the Lord. You give your children a nice head start, spiritually speaking, with Christ when you yourself walk with him. Verse 2, He was well spoken of by the brethren who were at Lystra and Iconium. Timothy had a good reputation. He was a man of high moral character, which is why he will become uh, a great spiritual leader in the church. Verse 3. Paul wanted to have him go on with him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in that region, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. Timothy would be preaching Jesus to unbelieving Jews. But they won't listen to him if they know that he is a Greek, the son of a Greek, an uncircumcised Greek. They'll never listen to him. Say, that's not right. Yeah, but that's the way it is. And we know from last time that the Jewish law, including circumcision, is not needed for salvation. We know that. But it's going to be needed by Timothy in order to preach to those who think it's important. And again, we see what we saw last time. Sometimes... To be useful to Christ, we must do what we really would not have to do by God's law. 4. And as they went through the cities, they delivered to them the decrees to keep, which were determined by the apostles and elders at Jerusalem. So, Paul told the Galatian Christians, the Gentile Christians, that... Uh, they were right. They had it right the first time. Salvation is by faith in Christ, not by keeping the Jewish law. And that is doctrine. It cannot be changed. And that is why it needs to be observed. And as I said last time, holy doctrine does not change. 5. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and increased in number daily. The Jewish Christians had been pressing the Gentile Christians in Galatia to keep the Jewish laws 
right? That's what this problem was all about. No doubt the efforts of those false teachers to impose Jewish religious rules on even would-be converts to Christ scared many of those would-be converts away. But now that's all, that's all in the past. Now, when the simple word of God is taught, those who are truly hungry were drawn to it and were drawn to Christ. Verse 6, Now, when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. And being forbidden by the Holy Spirit to go someplace and preach the word of God must have seemed kind of strange to Paul because he had been commissioned by the Lord himself to preach Jesus. The Holy Spirit is not forbidding Paul to preach the word of God, period. It's just that Paul cannot go east and west at the same time. And the Holy Spirit did not want Paul to go in the direction that he was headed. There's a lot of good things that Christians can do, but the need doesn't necessarily justify the call. In other words, Christ doesn't want us to try to do everything ourselves. It's not even His will. Verse 7 After they had come to Mysiah, they tried to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. So passing by Mysiah, they came down to Troas. The Holy Spirit would not let Paul go north and would not let him go south. When he came from the east, and so, the only place left was west. And that's the direction they started heading. Sometimes God's will is discovered by a process of elimination. Everything you try is a closed door, except for one that opens. And that's the way it was with Paul right here. Verse 9. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. Macedonia is in Europe. God is calling Paul to go to Europe and preach the gospel. Do you realize how big that is? Do you realize what you are seeing here? Instead of going east into China, instead of going south into Africa, God told Paul to take the gospel west into Europe into that area that eventually spawned America this is huge for us if Paul does not go west western civilization does not exist America as we know it does not exist America as it, as it has been does not exist 10 now after he had seen the vision Immediately we sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. And so, Paul and Silas and Timothy, and also Luke, the writer of Acts, they are God's big foursome, about to enter Europe with the gospel and plant churches and plant seeds of Western civilization. And these four guys are on fire for Christ. And it will take holiness and determination to get the church going in that area because many of our ancestors came from that area and it was very a sinful, very sinful area. 11. Therefore, sailing from Troas, we ran a straight course to Th Samothrace and the next day came to Neapolis and from there to Philippi, which is the foremost city of that part of Macedonia, a colony. And we were staying in that city for some days. Philippi was a Roman colony. These people were Roman citizens. They had Roman customs. They spoke Latin. And they were very immoral. And so these men of God have their work cut out for them. Verse 13. And on the Sabbath day, we went out of the city to the riverside, where prayer was customarily made. And we sat down and spoke to the women who met there. The Jews in the Roman Empire often held their religious meetings as far away from the heathen as they possibly could. So these ladies are outside the city limits praying. And you know what? This little prayer group right here, 
meeting outside the city by the riverside, that little prayer group may have been the reason that God told Paul to take the gospel to Europe rather than to China or to Africa. These ladies, these people were praying and God heard that prayer and sent these missionaries into Europe as an answer to that prayer. So never underestimate the power of our prayers. 14. Now, a certain woman named Lydia heard us and she was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira who worshipped God and the Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul Lydia believed and applied the word of God that Paul taught God opened her heart because of our sin nature man's heart is naturally closed to the word of God it takes the power of God to open our hearts to his word. 15. And when she and her household were baptized, she begged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. So she persuaded us. Lydia insisted that the apostles stay at her place. And I suppose it's only natural for Christians who are fed the word of God to want to continue to listen to the word of God and that's no doubt why she wanted him there 16 now it happened as we went to prayer that a certain slave girl possessed with a spirit of divination met us who brought her masters much profit by fortune telling fortune telling similar practices are forbidden by God in his word but it is a money maker today as it was with this girl and her owner, so like many other bad things, it is done in spite of the fact that it is bad. 17. This girl followed Paul and us and cried out, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. Someone says, Man, great! Isn't this fantastic? She is speaking, this demon-possessed girl, she's speaking well of Paul and the message of Christ. How wonderful! No, it is not great. It is Satan being very slick, being very sly. Watch this. The Jews who lived in that area, they needed Christ. But they knew that this girl was under the control of demons because they knew that fortune telling and stuff like she was doing, it was all demonic. It was, it was, it was forbidden by God. And so this is Satan's attempt to turn those Jews off to the message of Jesus. A demon-influenced girl, a demon-possessed girl saying Jesus is the way would make the Jews skeptical of Christ. Verse 18 And this she did for many days, but Paul, greatly annoyed, turned and said to, said to uh, the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her, and he came out that very hour. St. Paul did not want the help of some demon. The last thing Christ wants is some demon-possessed, immoral person claiming to speak for him. God doesn't need to be identified with that sort of person. 19. But when her master saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities. So this girl was delivered from a demon and from one of the sins which was ruining her soul, but her owners don't care. They don't care. Her owners are angry because she cannot tell the future anymore. See, the word of God was tolerated by her owners until it started costing them some cash now they're angry now they bring Paul and Silas in arrest this guy arrest these guys verse 20 and they brought them to the magistrates and said these men being Jews exceedingly trouble our city in other words this Paul is a troublemaker your honor if a Christian is faithful to speak truth and live holy then someone in this wicked world is going to get angry about it. 
21. And they teach customs which are not lawful for us, being Romans, to receive or observe. Rome had several legal religions, and they were suspicious of any new religion that came along. And that's why they viewed Christianity with suspicion. 22. And the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates tore off their clothes and commanded to be commanded them to be beaten with rods. And when they had laid many stripes on them, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. The Jews, by order of God in his word in the Old Testament, could not whip any criminal more than 39 times. The Romans had no limit. And so Paul and Silas get a beating from the Romans. They get a severe beating because of their faith in Jesus Christ. And later on, in 2 Corinthians, Paul will write and say how he was beaten beyond number, meaning he was beaten beyond the number 39. That man suffered for Jesus Christ. 24. Having received such a charge, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. Now, get this picture. Paul and Silas, backs ripped open, Looked like shredded paper, probably. Then they are thrown into a varmint-infested, filthy prison. They are laying on their backs with those open sores, laying on their backs with their legs spread and their feet locked in stocks. I wanted that picture to be clear in our minds before we read, before we read verse 25. Look at it. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Paul and Silas were not angry at God for their situation. They were worshiping God. In this miserable situation, they are worshiping God. The other prisoners who did not know Christ were listening to them. They were observing Paul and Silas while they were in this miserable and painful situation. And you never know who is watching you. You just don't. You never know who is observing you as a Christian, taking note of how you, as a Christian, handle trouble. And it can either be a good testimony or a bad one. 26. Suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were loosed. Paul and Silas were not praising God in order to get him to do something. They were praising God. Period. Praising God so your circumstances will change, that is not a good reason to praise God. That is a selfish reason to praise God. Praise God because He deserves it. Not to try to manipulate Him. Praising God should be focused on the goodness of God. Now, if He should intervene and change the situation for the better, well, that's a bonus. And often He does. And God gave Paul and Silas a big bonus right here. 27. And the keeper of the prison awaking from sleep and seeing the prison doors open, supposing the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. Suicide is a sin. But in that culture it was considered an honorable way out, especially if death was imminent anyway. And death was definitely imminent here, because any guard who allowed his prisoner to escape would be put to death. But Paul called with a loud voice, saying, Do yourself no harm, for we are all here. Paul did not care whether this jailer was an enemy or not. He didn't want him to die, and he didn't want him to go to hell. So he stepped in and prevented his death, and he will tell the jailer about Jesus Christ. 29. Then he, the jailer, called for a light, ran in, and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas, and he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? This man had been on the edge of hell. But because Paul cared, he is now on the edge of salvation. You know, Paul 
And Silas could have ran out of that lousy prison and could have left this man die and go to hell. But they didn't. Instead of escaping, Paul yells out, Hey, we're all here. Don't kill yourself. Paul would rather remain in custody in a lousy situation if it meant that this jailer had an opportunity to receive Christ. That is the kind of Christ focus that Paul and Silas had. And so he says, What must I do to be saved? 31. So they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. That is not talking about an intellectual assent, an intellectual belief. Salvation is more than that. You have to take the whole Bible when it comes to any doctrine. And the faith that saves clearly in the Bible is in essence a relationship with Christ. Saving faith is repentance. It includes repentance. It includes a relationship that serves Christ out of love. That's what saving faith is. And this jailer is offered that relationship right here. And next time, we will pick up